Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm heading back to my roots to cover a video by none other than Eric Hovind. This one's exciting for me because one of the criticisms that I've repeatedly levied against Young Earth creationism is that it relies entirely on poking holes in the theory of evolution and other science that they disagree with and like to lump into evolution as though they are all the same and inextricably linked, rather than presenting any scientifically backed alternative to evolution, acting as though creationism would just be the default fallback position if they managed to discredit evolution enough. But this video is called Beyond Darwin, a scientific alternative to evolution. So will this finally be the video where a creationist actually tries to do something other than just say evolution has problems and actually present a solution of their own? I have my doubts, but that's what the title says, so let's go! We decided that today we'd talk about Beyond Darwin. What's the scientific alternative to evolution because we need one? Well, not to backtrack this early, but you only actually need one if evolution is wrong. And despite the fact that creationists have been chronically unable to come up with one, instead relying on their attempts to poke holes in evolution, they have never been able to accomplish their goal of actually proving evolution wrong. So the next step of providing a scientifically backed alternative that is more than just God did it has never really mattered all that much, because they've never made it to the stage where that would be necessary. They think they have, which is why I bring it up when relevant, but the reality is that they have not. For probably 15, 20 years now, the Discovery Institute has gathered scientists and started writing uh, and creating ideas around the idea of intelligent design. Yes, it was a thinly veiled attempt to sneak creationism into the classroom after creationism itself had been thoroughly discredited. They pared down the religious language and gave their work a superficially scientific patina, but it is still, at its core, creationism. Now, historically, they weren't coming out and saying the God of the Bible. Right, and that's because it's an organization that was designed specifically to push creationism into the classroom. So if they did just come right and say the God of the Bible, then they'd be denied outright, as teaching religious creation narratives in science classrooms is a big no-no. Well, it was a big no-no. With the current U.S. Supreme Court, it wouldn't surprise me if they decided that the protection of religious expression extended to teachers teaching their religion as though it were science in public school classrooms. <sighs> okay, now that I've depressed myself with the absolute bonkers shit show that is the American judicial system, let's get back to Eric. Uh, one of the guys that's been part of the Discovery Institute for a long time, Michael Denton, is exposing that, look, evolution has to move beyond Darwin. The article that Eric is showing, How We Move Beyond Darwin to the Miracle of Man, is basically a bait and switch. There is little to nothing in that article that actually has anything to do with evolution. It's mostly just an ad for Denton's book. And based on what is written there, it amounts to nothing more than Denton getting confused about cause and effect. He spends a good chunk of it talking about how amazing it is that the carbon atom is perfect for sustaining life. Yeah. Carbon-based life like ours relies on the properties of carbon to sustain itself. In other news, the towel that I dropped into the water is now wet. Obviously, that's because the water was perfectly designed to make the towel wet, right? We, we, we've got to go past what Darwin taught us. Uh, and I'll give you a little history lesson here in just a second. But we've got to move past this idea because it's not healthy. It's actually hindering, it's actually hurting science because it's forcing scientists to look at the data through the lens of Darwinian evolution being true and then forcing them to interpret the data with that lens rather than saying, hey, what are our options? Yeah, that sounds all fine and good superficially, but we're at a point with evolution where the evidence is just so strongly in its favor that that's just not a reasonable expectation. The time for looking at the data and seeing what conclusion it would lead us to was way back before we had found the conclusion that the data led us to, which was evolution. When Darwin came onto the scene, he did not set out on his journey on the Beagle to prove evolution right. He was just studying nature, God's creation, as he likely would have put it at the time. But when looking at the evidence without a predetermined conclusion, evolution became rather obvious. So obvious, in fact, that Darwin wasn't the only person to formulate this idea. Alfred Russell Wallace came to the same conclusion around the same time as Darwin, completely independently. In fact, 
At the time when Darwin and Wallace were working, the previous evolutionary ideas were largely considered unscientific and received extensive criticism from people like Charles Lyell, who creationists often attack for coming up with uniformitarianism as a way to make extra time for evolution to happen so that he could spite God. Despite the fact that it was in his book that posited uniformitarianism where he criticized the transmutation of species, which was the precursor to evolution. And he died a devoted Christian who believed in a worldwide flood, just one that was gentle enough to have not left any geologic record of itself. So why is it that creationists need to claim that we're starting with the conclusion and interpreting evidence in light of that predetermined conclusion, rather than starting with the evidence and following it where it leads? Simple. It's projection. They want to preempt us claiming that that's how they work by leveling that accusation at us first, thus poisoning the well so that when we make that accusation of a creationist, the people who heard the creationist side of things first, likely other creationists, will hear that accusation as a no you type of argument. Except, as I'm sure we'll see in this video, Eric is a presuppositionalist, which literally means that he begins everything with the conclusion that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, and filters all of his information through that lens. And he is quite explicit about admitting that. So this accusation against those who accept evolution ends up being rather blatant projection in this case. I've got my own issues with the intelligent design community. I wish they'd come out and say, it's God right away. It is a a bottom-up approach to try to um, show the existence or prove the existence of God. I prefer the top-down approach. See? I'll let him make it a bit more explicit in a bit, but this is literally what I just said. He likes a top-down approach, where you start with the conclusion and work your way backward, interpreting the evidence only in a way that would have it lead to your conclusion, even if you do have to ignore a bunch of it and interpret that which you don't ignore in complete isolation from the other bits of evidence because there is no way to make them cohesively point to your conclusion. And he apparently doesn't like the Discovery Institute's bottom-up approach at looking at the evidence first. Which is fucking hilarious, because the good old Disco Toot also uses a top-down approach. They just pretend it's a bottom-up approach in order to infiltrate classrooms, which you'd think Eric would like. And actually, this is one of the reasons that I think Eric is probably one of the honest creationists out there. I think he sincerely believes what he says, which serves to explain why he would fall for the creationist propaganda of the Discovery Institute when they claim to be working from a bottom-up approach. The next clip is a bit long, he goes on a bit of a winding analogy in order to explain what he means, but I'll let him finish the analogy before responding. Um, we, we relate it to a crime scene. If you walked into a convenience store and you were the detective and you were there to investigate a robbery and a murder and you walked into this crime scene and you got your police tape all around, nobody's come in and you start checking out the evidence and you see some broken glass and it looks like the, the guy broke in and then you see some of the bags of chips had fallen. It looks like some people had fought right there. Then you see the body of the victim. You see where he's laying. There's a footprint in the blood. That same footprint is over on the countertop. Looks like he had hopped over the countertop. The cash out of the cash register is gone. So obviously a robbery. You could deduce and look at the evidence and try to figure out, paint a picture of what happened here. But if somebody else comes along and says, oh, hey, uh, the store had a security camera. Here, watch this. And they take you to the back room and hit play and you watch the murder and the robbery unfold. Now you know exactly where each piece of the puzzle fits. Yes, but here's the thing. Video evidence is not the be-all and end-all of evidence. If the robber had their face covered, as the ones in the video that you were showing did, then you would still need to use all of that other evidence as part of the process of figuring out who did it. And when it comes to court, you need to provide verification that the CCTV footage is authentic. It's not just assumed to be so. And there needs to be documentation about the chain of custody of the tape, so that the court can be certain that the footage was not manipulated at any point. So yeah, it's not merely a case of, here's a video, the rest doesn't matter, the video's definitive. The video itself is merely a part of the whole body of evidence. In the same way, I go, guys, it's not ignorant to pull out the videotape of how God created the heavens and the earth and say, God is the creator. He told us how he did it. Well, no, the Bible is not analogous to the CCTV tape in that case. 
If we want to hold to this analogy, the Bible would be more like a transcript that someone who was not involved in the crime in any way claims is the transcript of the CCTV tape, except the store that was robbed doesn't even have a CCTV system installed, and the person claiming it was the transcript isn't even claiming to have directly transcribed it themselves, but they are passing on a transcription that was compiled from several different transcripts, many of which directly contradicted each other, and some of which were combined into one transcript despite the contradiction. With the analogy thus corrected, we can see why the transcript would not be admissible in court, and likewise when it comes to figuring out the origin of the universe and life within it, the Bible should not be treated as authoritative. I mean, maybe if it actually got a bunch of stuff verifiably right, we could actually consider what it says as a part of the body of evidence, but given just how wrong it is about so many things, the appropriate thing to do here is to dismiss it as irrelevant at best. Well, at least when it comes to sciences like geology, cosmology, biology, astronomy, and, you know, pretty much all of the physical sciences. From an anthropological perspective, though, it is undeniably an important collection of books that gives us a glimpse into the development of a fascinating ancient culture. But that's not what Eric is talking about here. In my experience, young earth creationists are happy to trade the importance of the Bible from an anthropological and historical perspective in exchange for pretending that it got science right, even though the authors of the Bible seem to have been under the impression that what kind of sticks a goat was looking at when it had sex would determine the pattern of the resultant baby goat's fur. So I stick with, I start with, I say, the videotape, the surveillance footage of what happened, God's word, you stick with the transcript of non-existent video footage with a severely broken chain of custody. And all the science, all the data fits perfectly with what God's word actually says. If that were true, you wouldn't need to start with it as the conclusion. In the case of a robber being caught on CCTV, with all the evidence that you brought up, they would likely be able to catch the guy even without the video. And given that usually a robber will have their face covered while robbing a store, you would still need to demonstrate that your suspect really is the person in the footage even if the footage were admissible in court. Even if I grant that the Bible is analogous to the security footage, you still need to use the rest of the evidence to show that God is, in fact, the being that is depicted by the footage. And you can't do that. You only ever try to attack the integrity of the rest of the evidence, rather than presenting any of your own. This video is titled such that you should be presenting your own evidence, which would be new for a creationist, but we're a quarter of the way in and you haven't said anything that isn't just typical creationist rhetoric at this point. Right when Darwin was coming out with what he was promoting, Darwin and evolution, People were already dissenting and doubting that. Yes, like I said earlier, the precursors to Darwin's theory of evolution were not taken very seriously among scientists. So Lamarckian evolution, for instance, was the idea that an organism would acquire a trait during its lifetime and then pass that trait on to its offspring, with the quintessential example being of the precursor to the giraffe needing to reach the higher branch to obtain food, stretching its neck, and when it reproduces, its offspring will start with a slightly longer neck. This was, and remains to this day, wrong. The mark is dead. And it was the primary idea that scientists did not take seriously in Darwin's time. The fact that the presuppositions of the scientists working in Darwin's time led them to not take evolution seriously, but they changed their minds when presented with compelling evidence, does not help your case that scientists begin with evolution as the conclusion and find ways to make the evidence fit it. It demonstrates rather the opposite, actually. One revealing the fine tuning of nature for human existence. And there's the crux. I skipped most of this quote, he's just reading directly from the article that he showed earlier, but the article doesn't even have anything to do with evolution. It's all about making the teleological argument, trying to demonstrate that the universe was made with people in mind, rather than trying to discredit evolution. Notably, Michael Denton, the guy whose article you are quoting, accepts the theory of evolution. The design argument that he proposes is one where a universe was designed in order to make the evolution of human beings possible. So is your new thing that you accept evolution? If it's not, why are you using an article written by an evolutionist to make your point? Already people were going, oh, wait a minute, this universe is perfectly designed and they've, they've um, really helped develop the fine-tuning argument, how the gravitational force has to be absolutely perfect and all these different scientific laws that they say are on a razor's edge and yeah there we go see that version of the fine-tuning argument is all about getting a universe where evolution of carbon-based life is possible so if that's the one you want to use go for it 
but it assumes old ages, evolution, and that there is room for metaphorical interpretation in the Genesis story. Also, it's got its own problems. For one, you're showing that the life-permitting range is tiny compared to the whole spectrum of values for these constants and laws and whatnot, but have you demonstrated that it is possible for them to be different? Does your little graphic there take into consideration the fact that there's quite a bit of variation that the constants could have that would still allow for a universe with life like ours? Have you ruled out the possibility of other combinations resulting in universes that would be hospitable to life that is not like ours? And on top of that, there are some changes that we can be fairly certain would result in a universe that is more hospitable to life than the one we live in. The cosmological constant, for instance, is ever so slightly positive. If it were slightly negative, that would encourage a greater amount of galaxy and star formation, resulting in more matter that is available for life to use. So we know that the universe is not fine-tuned to be optimal for life, despite being possible for life, and in addition to all of that, the ultimate problem with the fine-tuning argument is the very existence of the argument itself. If there were no god, what kind of universe would you expect to find life in? One in which life is possible, obviously. But if there were a god, what kind of universe would you expect to find life in then? Any damn universe that that god wanted to put life in. If the universe were clearly not fine-tuned for life, and yet life existed in it anyway, that could potentially be evidence that some supernatural being exists and is keeping things going. But that's not what we see. We merely see that life is sustained in a universe where it's possible for life to be self-sustaining. And then they go, listen, if you were to move just a little bit this way, an, in an inch this way, or an inch this way out of this hundreds of miles or thousands of miles, you don't get life. And anyway, they present this and show it looks like life was designed. Again, they're coming from the data, from the, from the facts, from the information, and trying to deduce what happened. So apologies that I keep cutting back to him at times that seem awkward, like he might be in the middle of saying something, but this seems to have originally been a live stream, so he's not exactly at his best here, but he is talking about a graphic that's used to represent fine-tuning, a ruler that is thousands of miles long with a little tiny spot in the middle where life is possible, which I already addressed when I talked about his little graphic there. But what I want to mention here is that no, those graphics and the people who make them are not starting with the data and deducing God from it. They are starting with God and going data mining, ignoring the times when it looks like the universe is not fine-tuned, ignoring how much variation there is in what these constants could be that would still allow for life, and pretending like it's even possible for anyone to know at this point in time whether variation of these constants is possible or whether there have been other universes that have existed with variations in the constants, with the universes with the constants that for life, being the ones in which life develops, looks around and says, wow, this universe must have been designed for me because I wouldn't exist otherwise. The amount of knowledge they have to pretend to have in order to draw that conclusion is absurd. And that's even if I ignore the amount of knowledge that they have to pretend not to have in order to not have their conclusion undercut before it begins. I go the other direction, but, but he goes on, he says, as the Darwinian, uh, paradigm tightened its grip on mainstream biology and science. All vestiges of the old teleological organis organismic universe, all notions which place humankind or life on earth in any special or privileged place in the order of things were banished from mainstream academic debates. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a problem. No, that's not a problem. When we find out that something is true and is well supported by the data and makes testable predictions and consistently holds up to scrutiny even when entirely new fields of science are discovered that had the potential to completely falsify it, like genetics, it ceases to make sense to not start with the idea that this well-supported theory is accurate. We don't expect astronomers to begin every single one of their papers with a section demonstrating that the Earth is not flat and that geocentrism is false. Those ideas are so thoroughly disproven at this point that it would be ridiculous to expect that from astronomy, and astronomers have better things to spend their time doing than reiterating millennia-old bits of evidence for the globe Earth. That is the equivalent here. In order for evolution to be false, most of what we know about several entire fields of science would have to also be false. But these fields of science continue to produce accurate and useful discoveries. Add the young earth into the mix, and the number of scientific fields that have to be completely thrown in the bin and started over increases well past the biological and paleontological areas into geology, astronomy, physics, anthropology, history, cosmology, and more. So yeah, I don't expect biology 
geologists to prove evolution in every paper, just as I don't expect geologists to prove that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old every time they publish a classification of a rock sample, or an anthropologist to prove that humanity has existed for longer than 6,000 years when discussing ancient Native American cultures, and so on. When we are looking at the world and saying we are not going to allow the supernatural to come into the scientific debate. The supernatural has nothing to do with it at this point, my dude. The teleological argument is still popular among apologists, even the ones who accept science, because at its core, as with most arguments for God, it relies on scientific unknowns in order to work. We don't know why the constants are what they are, therefore God must have made them that way. It is a classic God of the gaps. But with evolution, you don't get to exploit the gaps, because evolution is very well understood. Sure, sometimes there are gaps with the specifics of how some feature evolved, or how some fossil fits into the overall evolutionary picture, and creationists love to latch onto those when they appear, but when the gap is inevitably closed, they always either ignore the fact that we have an explanation, or they rationalize it away, trying to figure out why the answer isn't actually the answer. The only time creationists have ever had a point about something is when they talk about how science communicators will often hypothesize about what environmental factors existed in the past that would have led to the selection pressures that favored certain characteristics over others. Often those scenarios are imaginative storytelling, meant to capture your attention in order to get you to learn something about the actual hard science, and if you ask any scientist who is actively researching anything to do with evolution, they will readily tell you that we can only speculate about those types of things, but evolution Evolution does not rest on these stories. Evolution rests on the hard data that underlies those stories. So even when creationism does have a point, it would be like them getting upset when a parent tells a toddler that babies happen when two parents love each other very much and do a special kind of hug, instead of explaining every detail about sex and reproduction. You gotta consider the target audience. Your average Joe will be way more interested in hearing about those dinosaurs were fighting each other in this made up scenario that will result in them having a rudimentary grasp of the situation than if you just started presenting straight up facts and data to them. And yes, I did just imply that if you're not deeply interested in evolution, you're the same as a toddler who doesn't know where babies come from. Evolution is cool as fuck, and it's not my fault you can't do the ADHD hyperfixation thing like I can. That's a problem. It's certainly not scientific to do so. No, you know what's not scientific? It's not scientific to ignore that literally every field of science says that you are dead wrong. Letting a biologist not prove the basics in every paper they write is fine. Unless you think that in math class before solving the quadratic equation, the kids should be required to demonstrate all the fundamentals of math that make the quadratic equation possible, and not just once, every single time they have to use it. It would get incredibly tedious and would just be a colossal waste of time, just like proving evolution in every biology paper would be. Darwin won, Eric. It's time that you accepted that. My name is Darwin, not Darlews. And they'll argue, well, science can only deal with the natural world. I get it. But then you need to stick with just the natural world. We do? There's nothing supernatural about evolution. And you need to stop trying to explain how things came into the natural world. Oh, you're talking about cosmology again. Okay, sorry, I was operating under the assumption that this would be a video mostly about evolution, given that he references Darwin in the title and keeps coming back to comparisons with Darwin. Well, Eric, have you ever asked a cosmologist about whether they think the origin of the universe was supernatural? To quote Sean Carroll from his debate with William Lane Craig, well, you know what, it's recorded, so let's just hear Carroll himself say it. The discussion we're having tonight does not reflect a debate that is ongoing in the professional cosmology community. If you go to cosmology conferences, there's a lot of talk about the origin and nature of the universe. There is no talk about what role God might have played in bringing the universe about. It is not an idea that is taken seriously. In modern physics, you open a quantum field theory textbook or a general relativity textbook, you will not find the words transcendent cause anywhere. What you find are differential equations. This reflects the fact that the way that physics is known to work these days is in terms of patterns, unbreakable rules, laws of nature. Given the world at one point in time, we will tell you what happens next. There is no need for any extra metaphysical baggage like transcendent causes on top of that. It's precisely the wrong way to think about how the fundamental reality works. 
So yeah, cosmology is very much a field of science that works within the bounds of naturalism. And you now, if you're just gonna stick with the natural world, you now can't explain things like logic and morality uh, and the very science that you're using. Oh God, he's just jumping all over the damn place now. Okay, behind the scenes stuff. Sometimes you can tell how far ahead I watch in a video before I start scripting, because I will often reference things that are happening later, but I usually don't watch the full video all the way through, and for whatever reason I just don't go back to my script to change things if I predicted something wrong. I will go back to fix factual errors, and if I predicted something wrong enough to change my overall approach, I might go back then, but usually it's little things like this that I don't fix. It's usually subtler than this, but Eric is all over the place, so I just can't keep up. Okay, here we go. Logic. The laws of logic are descriptive laws that we use to describe how the world works. If the world worked differently, we'd have different laws of logic to describe that world. No god needed. Morality. Morality is more of a problem for people like Eric, who believe that a god wrote morality on all our hearts, because it's painfully obvious that different cultures have different moral codes, and even different individuals within the same culture will have moral differences. The only moral precepts that approach anything like universal agreement are things that have a clear evolutionary advantage. Don't kill, don't steal, stuff like that. And even then, the agreement is only mostly universal. We will disagree about circumstances in which killing or theft could be morally permissible. So even in morality that is mostly universally agreed on, there will be differences of opinion when you get down to the details. As to science, the science that we're using was specifically designed to be a workaround for our fallible senses, and by its very nature it will over time correct any errors to be more in line with reality. Sure, science does have its issues, but it is the best system that we have for learning about reality, and so far it has consistently produced reliable and useful results. Science, the laws of science, are not material in nature. Not material does not automatically mean supernatural. You can't just assert that, you gotta connect those dots. They'll say, well they're just a product of the universe. How, why? You're just saying that. No, they're human inventions. Science and logic were invented by humans to describe the universe, and morality is essentially the result of how we feel about certain actions. But regardless of the source of our morality, one thing is certain. It is subjective. Because if a universe existed without thinking beings, subjects for morality to act on, then morality itself would not exist. It would be meaningless to say that something happening in that universe is moral or immoral, because there are no subjects to which morality would be applicable. So despite the apologist's protestations, morality is, in fact, subjective. We've got to move beyond Darwinian evolution. Yeah, none of what you just said has anything to do with evolution. Except maybe morality, as our moral compasses seem to have evolved to help us survive as a social species. So we ask questions like, hey, were humans created, or did we evolve? We evolved. If animals, uh, if there are animals, were the animals created, or did those animals evolve by chance? They evolved, and he never mentions it, but plants did too. By chance is an interesting addition here, though. Certainly, there are aspects of evolution that have a degree of randomness to them, but evolution itself is not a random process by any means. Well, if, if we got a question about humanity, we got a question about animals, we got to ask the question about this whole planet. Was planet Earth created, or did planet Earth evolve by itself? And now we've left the realm of the theory of evolution and have entered into Eric's daddy's six kinds of evolution. The Earth did not evolve in the biological sense of the word, no. The Earth formed through the conglomeration of material in our sun's protoplanetary disk. It, to me, is mind-boggling to watch cosmos and how they'll show the moon forming. They'll just show all these comets coming and making the moon, and it was, you know, 200,000 miles closer to the Earth. Well, it's what? So we're talking about a moon 73,000 mile, 73, miles away from planet Earth? Do you realize what kind of problems you have there? The inverse square law would take effect and the moon and the earth would just crash into each other anyway. What he's trying and failing to say is that with large orbiting bodies like planets and moons, there is a limit to how close they can get to each other before the effects of gravity become catastrophic, resulting in one of them being torn apart. It's called the Roche limit. Unfortunately for Eric, this is something that we can calculate. 
The Roche limit for the Earth is 18,470 kilometers, or 11,470 miles, which means that, using your 73,000 miles number, the Moon was, at its formation, more than six times farther away from the Earth than the Roche limit, meaning that there would be no catastrophic tearing up of lunar material. And this may seem like a petty point to add on here, and it is, but I'm bringing it up anyway. The inverse square law would not take effect. That's just the math of how gravity works over distance. It's always in effect. Was the Earth created or did the Earth evolve? When you watch these shows, they make it just sound like, of course it evolved. Of course that happened. No, it's not of course it evolved. It's of course our planet formed in the way that planets form in the universe. We have no reason to believe that our planet is special in its formation. And when you pay close attention, you're going, it's absurdity. It's fairy tales. They're making this stuff up. It is not scientific whatsoever. I mean, you can read all about it in scientific papers, which includes mathematical modeling verified through computer simulation, observations of extrasolar planetary disks, the study of the composition of primitive meteorites, and a whole host of other highly scientific endeavors. Surely to call all of that unscientific, you must have a model that better explains the data and can similarly be confirmed through computer simulation, right? Or is this just an argument from personal incredulity, where you personally find it hard to believe and so dismiss it without doing any of the appropriate research? Because I know you're not going to want to hear this, but if I need to apply the label unscientific to one of these two approaches, it's not the one that's working with data, physics, math, and astronomical observations that's going to get that label. What about the entire universe? Was it created or did it evolve? Again, neither. As far as the theory of evolution is concerned, the universe does not reproduce, as far as we can tell anyway. So evolution does not apply here. Though I am sure someone after enough drugs has hypothesized that the universe is like a living thing, man. What if it totally is reproducing and there's like baby universes that we don't even like know about? But as far as I can tell, this is not one of the series contenders for the origin of the cosmos. What I can tell you, though, is that the contenders that we do have, while admittedly more speculative than the origin of the solar system, also involve math and simulation and data, while your simplistic answer of God did it fails to adequately account for any of that. As I've said in previous videos, even if God did do it, that still leaves us with the question of how he did it. What mechanism did he use to get it done? Sure, the Bible says he spoke and things happened, but even granting that magic spells like that are possible, what mechanism did it use? Did God have to speak out loud? Does that mean that there existed a medium through which sound waves could pass in order for God to be able to speak? Did God create that medium first? Did he speak silently? Is speak just a metaphor for thought here? These are the kinds of questions you need to answer if you want your model to be taken seriously. And as far as I can tell, there hasn't even been an attempt to answer these questions. Also, this is the periodic reminder that in this video we're nearly halfway through, and there still has not been a scientific alternative to evolution that has even been mentioned, let alone supported with evidence of any kind. If I grant everything Eric has said thus far, we get to a position of we don't know how the universe or planets formed, and we don't know how life got diverse. And that's the end of it. That's not an alternative, that's a gap that Eric hopes to stick God into. What about the properties that make up our universe? Time, space, matter, and energy. Were time, space, matter, and energy, were they created or did they evolve? Again, neither, but where they did come from depends on which cosmological model we're going with. And realistically, we probably haven't discovered the cosmological model that accurately describes the origin as of yet. But of all the models that we do have, which work with our current understanding of physics, not a single one has them being created by an untestable, unfalsifiable super being. And this brings us to the two basic worldviews that are out there. Some people look at this world, they say, a Big Bang is what made this world from absolutely nothing. No, that is a massive oversimplification of one specific cosmological model that isn't even the most popular model among cosmologists. And if you actually want to posit your own cosmological model, it would be super helpful to you if you could demonstrate that you have an understanding of the existing cosmological models. At least, if you want to be taken seriously by cosmologists and aren't just trying to appeal to Christians in an attempt to turn some of them into young Earth creationists and to provide simplistic thought-stopping techniques to the ones who already are young Earth creationists. 
Because if you repeat often enough that cosmologists believe this one ridiculous thing about the origin of the universe, then when someone who listens to you encounters one of the other cosmological models being presented by another layperson, like me, they don't need to actually work to understand what is being said. They can just rest easy knowing that surely that model amounts to nothing more than believing that the universe came from nothing in a Big Bang. Because after all, every cosmological model takes the Big Bang seriously, because, you know, it demonstrably happened? And the more sophisticated apologists who use the teleological argument that Eric attempted to use earlier in this very video even work from a starting point that includes the Big Bang, because the whole thing with that argument for God is that the universe was set up by God in the Big Bang to be optimal for eventually allowing the evolution of humans, so that includes Eric's evolution of the planet Earth. And since I'm convinced that Eric is sincere in his belief, I am also leaning towards a position where, rather than Eric actually understanding it and choosing to misrepresent it in order to make his point, I think Eric himself engages in these thought-stopping techniques, and so despite the fact that these things have been repeatedly explained to him in great detail, he has managed to not understand them through his use of these thought-stopping techniques. It's actually kind of sad. But I mean, it wouldn't exactly shock me to my core if I found out that he was just lying for Jesus and money this whole time. I can't tell what's going on inside his head, but if he is lying, he does a better job of pretending to be sincere than a lot of the other apologists who I know for a fact are lying, like Matt Powell. And this idea came out because, uh, who was the guy looking through his t uh, telescope? Uh, the Hubble. Uh, Hubble's looking through his telescope and he's realizing galaxies are getting further and further away. And no matter which direction he looked, the galaxies seem to be getting further and further away from where we're at. So he said, it looks like the universe is expanding. Well, they drew from that. Well, maybe if we go back in time, that means it used to be closer together. It's possible that everything started off as a singularity and then expanded. Okay, horrible explanation of how we discovered the Big Bang aside, I'm willing to bet that he doesn't mention that the guy who actually came up with the model that became known as the Big Bang was a Catholic priest, Georges Lemaitre. Because if the guy who developed Big Bang Theory believed in God, that would throw a pretty big wrench into the works of his idea that scientists are desperately working from a presupposition of naturalism in order to figure out how everything could work without a god. Hubble is much easier to disparage that way, as he was raised a Christian but seemed to shy away from professing any sort of actual belief, choosing instead to deflect any time he was asked. Also, while Hubble did discover redshift, which is the fact that galaxies that are moving away from us have their light waves stretched out as a result of the Doppler effect, making them appear shifted toward the red side of the electromagnetic spectrum, the key part of that that discovery was not the redshift itself, but the fact that the amount of redshift corresponded to the galaxy's distance from us. The further away something is, the more redshifted its EM radiation is. Actually, now that I think on it, redshifted is probably not a great term for it, but it's one that's so entrenched now that it doesn't really make sense to change it. Because if you shift microwave radiation towards the visible red light end of the spectrum, that would actually be violet shifting it unless when it passes the visibly red part of the spectrum it's still called red for some reason? In which case when you listen to the radio you're listening to it in red? None of that matters though, that's just my random irrelevant observation of the day. By the way, scientists are now beginning to reject the Big Bang idea. Do you have a citation for that? Which scientists? Come on, Eric, if you make a claim like that, you gotta name names and give sources. You can't just state it like it's a fact and move on. That'd be like if I just said, by the way, young Earth creationists are now beginning to reject the global flood idea. If I said that, wouldn't you want to know who? And yes, I did just cut him off there, but I did watch far enough ahead to verify that he never actually provides anything to support that assertion. So it's Hitchens razor time. That which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. From is this worldview, comes from the perspective of there is no God. Nope, it sure does not. Refer back to my previous comments about a Catholic priest being the guy who formulated the Big Bang Theory, or Charles Lyell being okay with the idea of a worldwide flood. There's also the example of Charles Darwin himself. He began his career with the goal of becoming a clergyman, and to that end he attended the University of Cambridge in order to get the Bachelor of Arts degree that the Anglican Church required at the time in order to become clergy. Upon his graduation from Cambridge in 1831, he set sail on the Beagle for a five-year mission to seek out new life and new civilizations. Hey, that kinda actually fits there. 
Except in the Star Trek context, new life and civilizations would literally be life and civilizations that are younger than Earth civilizations. While different civilizations on Earth would probably be roughly the same age, they'd just be newly encountered life and civilizations. But I digress. On his voyage, his goal was to discover the centers of creation, which would explain the diversity of life in terms of God creating life with a limited capacity for adaptation in different locations throughout the Earth. But the evidence he collected on his voyage convinced him of the opposite. So tell me, Eric, how exactly was Darwin looking for an explanation that would exclude God if he literally went on his foundational voyage with the intention of finding evidence for God's creative acts? Some people try to blend this there is no God idea with, well, maybe God used evolution. That's not how blending ideas works. What's happening is that Christians who actually put in the effort to understand science have come to the conclusion that the evidence for evolution is undeniable, and so try to make it fit within a biblical framework by not insisting on a selectively literal interpretation of the Genesis creation stories. And I say selectively literal here for a reason. Ask Eric if he believed that the snake was really just a snake, as it literally says in the story, and he will likely tell you that no, it's the devil in snake form. Ask Eric if the line warning in Genesis 2.17 that if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, in that day you shall surely die is literal, and he'll probably tell you that it's actually talking about a spiritual death, not a literal death, despite the story not even implying that. Also, I'd like to know how Adam managed to literally name every single non-marine animal. If we take the creationists at their word, the creation account in Genesis 2 is actually just giving a more detailed look at day 6 of the Genesis 1 creation account, not a separate story, despite the fact that God creates plants in this story when that happened on day 3 in the other one, but creationists say that that's what happened on day 6, and these days are literal 24-hour periods. So in less than 24 hours, Adam named every single non-marine animal and every single bird? According to Answers in Genesis, there were about 1,398 kinds of animals that fit that description, which means that if Adam had the full 24 hours to name them all, and didn't take any breaks to eat or sleep, he had less than one minute to come up with a new name for each kind of animal. Now, sure, you might be able to get through a few pretty quickly, but eventually the creative juices just stop flowing and you need some time to think. So does Eric think that that's what literally happened? Or is that part metaphorical? And what language is he naming them in? Do we still have these names today? Was there even a point in Adam naming all the animals if he did so in a language that was doomed to die out and we'd have to come up with new names anyway? As with most things in apologetics, if you take them seriously, they lead to far more questions than they answer. Which isn't inherently bad. After all, there are plenty of things in science that's once you start understanding them, they raise more questions than they answer. But the problem is that if the questions raised by taking apologetics seriously are answered, they make everything more absurd rather than giving clarity. See, I look at the world and I say, no, this world is incredibly designed. God was a smart designer. He's a very, very intelligent designer. That's the creationist worldview. Yeah, okay, but if you're providing an alternative to evolution, you can't just say, hey, I'm personally of the opinion that it sounds silly, therefore God is the less silly option. That's not how alternatives work. You have to provide an alternative that is at least as good at explaining the data as evolution, ideally better at it. And you have to be able to demonstrate that scientifically, not just through assertion and personal incredulity. As I expected, this video has just been an attempt to poke holes in our current understanding of science without actually providing any reason why creationism would be the better alternative. Just assuming that if enough holes are poked, creationism, and specifically Eric's version of young earth creationism, is the default fallback position. That's not how this works. Also, he now goes on this huge rant about Christians who accept evolution. I'm going to skip most of that bit. It's not relevant to this topic let alone what the James Webb Space Telescope is discovering. They're like, uh-oh, galaxies that are supposed to be uh, uh, um, just now forming, we're seeing them fully formed, fully functional. We got a problem. James Webb Space Telescope is destroying um, uh, classic um, um, astronomy and, and cosmology. It's destroying many of the things that they held dear about, about how the world began. It is doing no such thing. Discovering the old galaxies it has discovered was one of the primary missions that it was launched for. And according to astrophysicist Brant Robertson, the observations that it has made match what astronomers expected to find based on current models of galaxy formation. 
Now, sure, if you just read the coverage of these discoveries on news outlets like The Guardian, you'll see them talking about how these are universe-breaking galaxies that would require us to completely revamp our understanding of cosmology. But if you read the actual papers that spawned these news articles, you find phrases like, preliminary indications have suggested these candidate galaxies may be more massive and abundant than previously thought. However, without confirming distances, their inferred properties remain uncertain. And However, none of such candidates has yet been confirmed spectroscopically, leaving open the possibility that they are actually low-redshift interlopers. Notably, the galaxies discovered, if the redshift measured ages are accurate, are metal-poor and extremely young, which is exactly what we'd expect of a galaxy that formed immediately after the Big Bang. Also, this is the classic creationist dilemma. Even if what we learn about these galaxies turns out to be incompatible with current models of galaxy formation, requiring us to revamp those models? The creationists like Eric are left with a problem. If they accept the science that shows these galaxies to be too young for our current models, then they are necessarily also accepting the science that tells us that the light emitted from those galaxies has been traveling towards us for over 13 billion years, far longer than would be possible if the universe were a mere 6,000 years old. This is one of those things where, in order for you to make young Earth creationism scientifically feasible, you need to throw out and explain away all of the data that it is collecting, not just selective bits of it. Because, hey, we found a galaxy that is 13.4 billion years old, which is older than we expected, is not something that supports your claim that nothing in the universe is older than 6,000 years. But guys, it's time to move beyond Darwin. Let me share with you a couple more reasons why we need to move beyond Darwin and, and get a scientific alternative to evolution. Oh, I see. This video was entirely bait and switch. Shocking, I know. I could have never predicted that. But yet, here he is, admitting that they don't actually have a scientific alternative, they still need to get one. Here's a news flash for you, Eric. If you actually want there to be a scientific alternative to evolution, and you want that alternative to be widely accepted, you have to develop it independently of your attempts to poke holes in evolution. Sure, poking holes in evolution would necessarily be a part of the process, but it can't just be poking holes. It has to be, here's something that is not adequately explained by evolution, and this is the reason why my explanation is a better fit for the data. So far, you've only been engaged in here is something that is not adequately explained by evolution. Anyway, moving on. And what's more, the things that you claim are not adequately explained are usually pretty well explained. Your impression that they aren't explained stems from a lack of understanding, not from the explanation actually being inadequate. Are you familiar with DescentFromDarwin.org? Yeah, that's where a creationist organization, namely the Discovery Institute, got a bunch of scientists to sign their agreement to a statement that, on the surface level, is actually kind of in line with how science works. The statement was, We are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. Skepticism is the basis for all of science. It is a withholding of acceptance of an idea until sufficient evidence is presented. And random mutation and natural selection alone are not the only processes through which evolution works. So yeah, I would be skeptical of anyone who claimed that. And careful examination of the evidence is always encouraged in science, so of course that should apply to the evidence for the theory of evolution. Notably, on their most recent list, there are over a thousand signatories. I'm not counting the exact number, and for some reason the Discovery Institute seems hesitant to give it live updates, but it's still going and scientists can currently still sign the list if they like. They've been collecting signatures for 22 years now. And notably, they defined scientist pretty loosely and allowed basically anyone with an advanced science-related or apparently science-related degree to sign. There are plenty of engineers, computer scientists, dentists, aviation experts, philosophers, and more in unrelated fields. As of 2007, when they only had 700 signatures, fewer than 25% of them were from biologists. There are also people with no scientific qualifications who are allowed to sign, like Bernard Diabrera, who has never worked as a scientist and has no formal scientific qualifications, having an undergrad degree in the history of philosophy of science. Some of the people that signed it later asked for their names to be removed, feeling misled when they realized that the list was being used to promote creationism. What's more, the list is not a good representative sample. It cast its net far and wide and amassed a total of a thousand signatures, which amounts to about 0.01% of all scientists 
scientists worldwide. Meanwhile, the National Center for Science Education has a similar list of people who sign a statement affirming the theory of evolution, and in order to sign that, you not only have to be an active scientist, notably the dissent from Darwinism will accept signatures from former scientists and people with scientific sounding degrees that aren't actually scientists, but you also must be named Steve to sign this one, or some variation of Steve. Currently, there are 1,490 Steves who have signed, and since only about 1% of scientists have a name that is a variation of Steve, it can then be extrapolated that this represents about 149,000 scientists who would have signed if they were not forbidden because of their name. Discrimination, I know, it's wild. Anyway, this means that their petition accurately represents the opinions of at least 1.7% of scientists worldwide, a couple orders of magnitude more than the dissent from Darwinism. It still doesn't prove anything as far as the actual theory of evolution is concerned. At best, a successful petition of this kind would be an argument from authority. But it does show that it's far easier to find scientists who will agree that evolution is a thing than to find ones who disagree about evolution. For example, he shows a, a picture of an alligator and a fossil alligator. Now, according to the old Earth interpretation and, and according to the evolutionary interpretation, this fossil alligator would be somewhere between 54 and 37 million years old. So, couple things here. Firstly, was this fossil alligator examined closely and found to be morphologically identical to modern alligators? I doubt it. Sure, it looks superficially similar, but superficial similarities do not make something identical. It is quite possible, likely even, that evolution did happen in that time, but the overall body plan remained fairly stable. In fact, we know that the crocodilian body plan has existed for about 200 million years now, and while it does appear that crocodilians evolve slowly compared to other types of animals, the fact of the matter is that they do evolve, and there have been hundreds of species of crocodilians that are known through the fossil record in the course of that time. So yeah, crocodilians as a category are weirdly evolutionarily stable. After all, in the same time span that we went from the first crocodilians 200 million years ago to today, we wound up with a total of 24 species that made it to modernity, while well, birds ended up with about 10,000 species over that same time period, but just because something evolves slowly does not mean that it does not evolve. Nothing about evolution says that all species must change over time. If the environment is stable with no new selection pressures and the organism is already well adapted to that environment, then there is no evolutionary driving forces aside from genetic drift, and genetic drift on its own moves very slowly. This one's from Germany. Now, when they examine the, the crocodile from somewhere between 37 million and 54 million years ago, they notice something. It hasn't changed. Where was that examination published? And is it a crocodile or an alligator? I've been referencing crocodilians, which is a category that includes both, but a crocodile is a specific type of crocodilian, as is an alligator. And can we really trust you to say that it hasn't changed if you can't tell the difference between the two? Anyway, he goes on with more examples of the so-called living fossils, but the response is basically the same for all of them. Not only have there been evolutionary changes, albeit minor ones, to every single one of his examples, but evolution does not demand that an organism must change in order to survive. It is simply that the organism that is the best fit for the environment will survive to reproduce. If an organism is a good fit for an environment, and that environment remains relatively stable, then there is no reason that that organism should not also remain stable. It is time for us to move beyond Darwin and say Darwinian evolution doesn't make sense. There's got to be a better way. Well, unfortunately for you, not only does evolution make sense, but thus far, nobody has been able to come up with a better way. Maybe Eric will be the one to do it. But I doubt it, as in order to supplant an existing scientific theory, you must first actually understand it. And Eric clearly does not. There's got to be a better way. I happen to know what that better way is. Matter of fact, I'm going to share it with you. I know the better way. I've got a scientific alternative to Darwinian evolution. Oh, okay then. Maybe this video wasn't a bait and switch after all. Maybe in the last 2 minutes and 26 seconds of the 31 minute video, he will present the case for a scientific model that accurately accounts for all of our observed data better than evolution does, and so is worthy of consideration. Let's hear it, Eric. But first, I need to talk about what evolution means. I need to talk about Andy Stanley, and then I'm going to have time just at the end to give you the, uh, the, uh, the, the summary of what a scientific alternative is to Darwinian evolution. I don't understand. This is the end. 
There are two minutes and 10 seconds left. We're like 95% of the way finished this video. How can you still have more to go over before getting to it? Before I do that though, ah, uh, YouTube uh, and Facebook, I've got to let you guys go. I'm so sorry. I'd love for you guys to catch the rest of this program. It's available at Creation Today. Oh, okay. There it is. There is a scientific alternative to evolution, but in order to find out what it is, you have to send me money. I stopped the video before he got super grifty, but that is indeed where he goes with this. Unfortunately, Eric, if you want the scientific community to take what is supposedly your scientific idea seriously, you can't hide it behind a paywall like that. You gotta actually present it publicly. That's it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Mr. Rusty 103 who says, Western Canada checking in. Could pick anywhere in the city. You're within a 15 minute walk of a weed shop. They're fucking everywhere here. Although I think I might low key be in the city with the most dispensaries per capita. Well, glad to hear that Western Canada is embracing the concept of a 15 minute city. Well done. Thanks for watching. I'll be back next Friday with more, but if you need to get your rhino fix in before then, I live stream with Cirrus every Wednesday at 8.30 Eastern on my other channel, The Watering Hole, and I stream with my partner every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern here. Thanks to Tim Robertson for being my Patreon and sponsorships manager, and special thanks as always to my patrons, who are the scientific replacement for the current consensus that is my channel. If you'd like to be hidden behind a paywall rather than shouted from the mountaintops, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino, or by supporting the channel and one of the other methods that can be found at links.vicerhino.com, which is also where you'll find links to my other projects. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time! your average Joe will be way more interested in hearing about how those dinosaurs were fighting with each other in the made-up scenario that will result in them having a rudimentary grasp of the situation. <sighs> I should breathe more.